What's up, guys? Jamie Bedingfield here. This is Too Many Words, a podcast for readers and writers, schemers and procrastinators. Welcome to the show. Thanks for tuning in. Hope it's going well. Things here are, you know, the usual comfortable crazy. I am uh, I'm excited about this week's guest, so we're going to get right into it. I have author Max Gladstone on the show. He um he is to thank for the craft sequence series, which is one of um, one one of my favorite series. Each novel is a standalone, takes place in the same world, different part, um, and mostly different characters. And uh, he also writes short stories. Um, his story to a cloven pine, which is in, it's one of my favorites in the uh, robots first fairies anthology, which I've, I've mentioned in previous episodes. Yeah, let's get to my talk with Max. I absolutely love your craft sequence books. Thanks so much. It's uh, I'm really glad that they work for you. I like how the the stories are self contained, but the world I get to go back to. I just think that's awesome. I'm glad. Uh, that's something that was pretty important for me as I was starting out the series. I grew up in an era of large, heavy. Um, multi-volume, thousand-page book series that were never going to end, and we're still in that era now, sometimes yep. with exactly the same series. So it felt very important for me to try to tell complete stories. I think that's important. was important for me as a writer and also as somebody who remembered just endlessly waiting on the next Robert Jordan book and when is this thing ever going to end. Um, as a writer, it's important because ending a story is a skill like any other. You practice characterization, you practice openings, you practice working from an outline or not working from an outline, and you also practice ending. You practice tying things up and um, resolving those major plot threads that you've held in advance for four or five acts. So I wanted to be able to work on that scale. I wanted to be able to land things. And also I wanted my readers to be able to have a complete story experience really wherever, whatever book they happen to pick up. I was inspired in that a lot by Terry Pratchett, whose work I love in this regard, and also by Lois McMaster Bujold, who does much the same thing. You can pick up any Miles Horkosigan book and you can read it out of order if you've never read any Miles books at all, even though there is a very strict chronology. You can start at the beginning of his life or you can start with his mom and then work all the way through. But you can also just find a copy of Setaganda, and you'll know almost everything you need to know by the end of the first two chapters. And Pratchett, of course, is great at this as well. I really wanted to write a series of self-contained novels that would start adding up to things. Now, of course, I, I tried to do that, and continuity has crept in <laughs> more than I was intending. So I think the next couple of books um, in the sequence are going to be a little more closely tied to one another, sort of setting up problems that others will pay off. But for the most part, I've really enjoyed making those strong self-contained tales. By having that, does it help you like feel like feel that the world itself is bigger? It helps me feel like it's more fascinating. Okay. I think you can have a huge world from a single character's perspective or from a small set of characters perspectives or you can follow a world that's increasingly branching but what you can't do or what is very hard to do is telling a world in which there are many stories that matter yeah. i'm thinking about the wheel of time here as a good example you start with rand and parrot and matt and Nguyen and Ninev and the whole two rivers crew and they head out and it turns out that rand is the messiah and then Rand is either going to destroy the world or save it, the Dark One's going to rise, and that's really what's going on. That's the main thing. We meet more people, they have their own lives, interests, adventures, backgrounds, but they all kind of get subsumed into the larger meta plot of the Dark One is going to break free of his prison, the Forsaken are running around throwing magic at people, um, we need to stop them, we need to stop the Dark One, we need to save the world and possibly stop Rand from going insane. It's a really fun series in that way, but it means that everybody's concerns, some random innkeeper's notions, some um, 
uh, the, the sort of political backstory of a guy that we happen to run into on the road, they all end up rolling into this one major story. And we see the whole world, but there's really only one thing going on in it, no matter how many different angles there are to merge into that one thing. And that's not really how the world works. And I wanted to write a fantasy that felt more like how the world works as I see it. By that I mean there are a lot of different things happening at the same time, all over the place. Um, different, the sort of arc of history looks differently depending on where you're standing and who you are when you're standing there. Um, the American century, in quotes, looks one way from inside the continental United States, another from, you know, even Canada. You know, you walk a little bit north and the whole world looks just slightly different. Um, and if you're standing in, you know, Iran or something, it looks wildly different again. Um, so what kind of story do people tell about a century or a historical moment? What does this crazy moment of aggressive historical and social change that we're stuck in right now, what is that? How does it look, not just from our shores, but from through other people's eyes? So I wanted a framework that was strong and um, flexible enough to accomplish all these things. And one of the virtues I got as a result of setting my story in I was setting a number of different stories in a number of different cities around the world in different time frames, each starring a sort of set of characters, mostly unrelated. One of the things that gave me was the ability to have people tell more or less their own stories for um, Kavakana to be its own subject, for Kai to be her own subject in Full Fathom 5 and have a very different picture of the arc of world history than Terra has in Three Parts Dead, and to be worried about a different set of things than Terra is worried about or than Abelard is worried about. And similarly, you know, Caleb and Teo and the whole crew and Trisetti Alex have their own set of concerns. When we see Alicand or Agdell Lex in, um, in Ruin of Angels, those are people whose concerns are radically different from anything that's been going on in the New World or in Kavakana. So if I was stuck trying to fit all of these stories onto one necklace, so, so the same thread connected all of them, and I think some of them would necessarily get shortchanged. Some people would be um, rendered objects just by the virtue of their not being the subject of the narrative in the same way that, you know, any country on the wheel of time earth that happens not to have Rand in it at this particular moment is basically window dressing from a like global cosmic historical perspective. Um, so I could sort of end run around that. And now that I'm trying to tell the story of a major global event in this world, I have a number of people who I've already established as subjects, I've all, who I know what their angle is. And the reader also knows what their angle is. So um, it can kind of start to understand how people from different places would view a certain event differently. So also it's just, you know, fun to tell different stories in this way. Yeah. No, I bet. I've been working on a project and it involved a lot of world building, which is something that I've never, you know, done to this extent before. And I cool. kept getting stuck in this one spot and then it kind of hit me that I was kind of letting the world get away from me and I had more than one central story and that's where the problem was coming from because I was just, there's too much going on. Yeah, I mean, it's tricky. You, you can't have, the temptation is to have this sort of big sprawling tale. Um, certainly fantasy is set up for that as a business, but if you try to make the tale encompass the entire world, <laughs> you need a different sort of structure. You need something that's a little more rambling or even cosmic. I mean, I feel like we're doing ourselves a little bit of a disservice by looking uh, so much to Tolkien as a sort of trope maker for the multi-volume fantasy epic because Tolkien is... Um, awesome and fantastic and great, but also wrote one big book that just had to be 
put into three volumes because the binding technology, at least as I understand it, wasn't good enough to publish. And because the market wouldn't bear one single like 1,200 page book at that point. <laughs> so so, so you, know, you have The Lord of the Rings, which has a distinct beginning, middle and end as a single unit. And each of the books has sort of a distinct beginning, middle and end, but you really want to read the entire thing together. And so we start thinking about these you know, multi-thousand page epics with the same um, lens, through the same lens where you have sort of, you want the entire 14,000 page story to have the same beginning, middle and end. And I don't know, there are, I mean, there are other styles, there are other ways to try to make that work. Uh, the Mabartha is maybe a third as long as the whole Wheel of Time sequence. I just keep using Wheel of Time because it's a nice, uh, concise example of this whole thing. No, it is. The, the tricks that um, the Mahabharata deploys to try to make that structure hang together, the tricks of nested narratives and recurring characters and episodic narrative also, where you, you're following a lot of different incidents in certain characters' lives, where you're slowly introducing people and characters will get old and live and die. And so you have this sort of span of history and death is naturally clearing the board and sort of resetting the situation every once in a while, as opposed to trying to fit uh, the entire thing into two years. I don't know, there, there are just a lot of other examples that we can draw. Or speaking of episodic narratives, you've got Journey to the West, which is, you know, the in some ways the trope maker for the giant episodic anime quest story. Yes. A, a different chapter and every different chapter, every different set of three chapters is a new place with a new set of problems, a new challenge. We were talking, you know, tropes that are you kind of a go to. Dealing with, um, you know, royalty is another one. And I, I, I love dealing with the smaller factions, the the baker that needs to, you know, that gets mixed up mm -hmm. in that. And I, I really enjoy exploring the, the smaller corners of the magical grand places that we, we like to visit so much. No, I'm glad. I mean, this is it's something that I think is pretty important um, and is also pretty sort of a strong trend in American literature anyway. Um, it's It's really interesting how much fantasy can, likes to pull away from the doing of work um, when so much of the rest of our literature is on some level about work. You know, you have Moby Dick, which is about like just being on a whale ship mostly. You've got two or three hundred pages at most of, you know, Captain Ahab vengeance drama in the middle of a thousand <laughs> pages of we're just working on this boat. And I love that book I, so much. It's great. It's great, right? It's it, it's it's fantastic. And when I read it, I, I was so surprised. I don't know if this was also your experience, but just how little the cultural picture of Moby Dick connects with the actual text of Moby Dick, right? Yes. Like, well, you, you go into it thinking it's going to be all about Ahab, but it's not really. I. It, it's true. I don't and know, is that your? Well, so it's so unassuming in some ways, and it's saying so much. But it's. I feel like it's really easy to just overlook it and say it's dry. But just between the, the sentences, there's just like lush gardens to, to pull from. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know, the, the, I kept expecting to not like the whaling chapters, which is what a lot of people said. But for me, it was just this feast of detail. And you get so much weird character development throughout it. Like, OK, so Ishmael is going to spend the chapter talking about whiteness, which is an interesting thing for, you know, a 19th century American novel by a white man to do. Um, and the, uh, the, the scene that really stands out for me is the one where he's talking about whale anatomy um, and the skeleton of the whale. And he mentions being shipwrecked at one point outside of the context of the novel. You know, this is like later in Ishmael's career and shipwrecked on an island where some people are have set up a chapel or a sort of temple inside the skeleton of a beached whale and so he's wandering around and he really wants to take some uh, memorial of his experience back home because not a lot of people have intact whale skeletons to study so he <laughs> tattoos on his forearm the whale skeleton he just gets some uh, ash ink and, and jabs it into <laughs> his arm and it, that right there tells you a lot about ishmael and about his problem solving methods and it's such an outlandish and cool little story that you totally miss if you go into this and you're just sort of skimming around looking for the Ahab relevant stuff. It's so true. Um, yeah, 
No, the the tattoo is a great example. The the details that are it just paints such a complex character and um, world and outlook if you really just tune into it. Well, that was a fun Moby Dick diversion. <laughs> Uh, but I think it's really important. Um, and those kinds of examples can be really helpful for fantasy too. I mean, it's easy to um, look too closely at the fantasy canon as, and, and, and sort of ignore the larger universe of literature that it's all taking place in. Um, people borrow techniques and trade techniques all the time. And it's really kind of blinkered to just go in and think, oh, well, you know, I'm writing a fantasy novel, so it should only be referencing the game of, of fantasy. Especially, I think, now that there's such a complicated picture out there in the world of what you can do with fantastical tropes and uh, with science fictional tropes also. Yeah. There's so much overlap between the sort of fantasy section of the bookstore and the literary section of the bookstore. And I, I, there's a lot of, I think, mistaken apprehension that uh, genre is is sort of relegated to the trash heap the way that it was I think when I don't know when Vonnegut was writing or when Margaret Atwood was trying to figure out how to position herself but uh, it's a really different landscape now than it was gosh 30 years ago it is well and also like you know as far as like genres are concerned there's I feel like yeah there's a place to you know put the books but in so many cases I feel like the books that I'm reading you could up throw like five genres on them if you really wanted to pick things apart and be like you know this is a blend of this and this and yeah absolutely I and mean, you can't look at it as, as limiting you know these are like uh, like the hero's journey or any sort of writer's voyage kind of advice it's a tool set that you can use definitely well and I, like i i spoke to you before is i was getting like i i did i got so caught up in the world that i I forgot about my characters and why I was, you know, even there in the first place. And I had to put it down and ask myself, like, well, I don't know if you do this, but I ask myself a lot of questions by writing them down. Be like, what do you mm -hmm. want from this? Or, and <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Um, but well, sometimes you need to do it, right? <laughs> you can't get your thoughts in order any other way. Yeah, no, totally. Well, and some, I feel like if I keep too many thoughts in my head, they just, you know, they, it's like bumper cars with like, you know, the plague involved. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'd ask myself, like, what story do you, like, what story are you writing? And then, you know, I answered myself and I got myself back on track. And it's, it's, you know, you got to play with the mind. And that's for sure. Absolutely. I mean, as so much of this is about having a conversation with yourself. You, you need to listen to these weird sort of subconscious urges that are coming up that are trying to push the characters in this way or that. But you also need to figure out how to make something forward moving out of that. You can't just, well, I don't know, if you're Jackson Pollock, you can just throw a paint <laughs> against the wall and sell it. But you know, there's often an extra layer of translation. And for, I mean, for him too, for all I know, I don't know much about his process. Um, there's this extra layer of sort of translation and refinement that leads to uh, getting a strong story on the page or getting a, a good piece of work. Uh, the one thing that I discovered recently, which I am really still in love with, is um, just the practicality of Virginia Woolf's thoughts about how you put a scene together, for example. I've been slowly over the course of my writing life coming up with very, what seem to be very simple um, bullet points for just you know, how to build a scene or something like that. This is you know, truisms that I'll project or, or bounce off that feel so stupidly simple, <laughs> but actually took me a really long time to get to and have more complicated applications. Um, and I keep poking around in Wolf's letters and running into examples of her saying exactly this. And I think of Wolf as sort of an unrepentant stylist. She's amazing, she's riveting, but she sort of fits in my mind into that sort of giant school of modernists where I don't really know how they thought about technique or how they thought about what made a good scene because other stuff seems to just work um, and be super strange. And so it doesn't feel like there would be a lot of application to somebody who's not trying to go for that high mannered style. Um, but she's right about those exact sort of bullet points. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a letter where she's talking about how 
as early in the scene as possible, you need to make certain there's a dominant feeling that is something clear and something that the reader can understand and empathize with, uh, regardless of what you're doing, regardless of how weird the story is going to be. You need that feeling there because otherwise the reader is lost and doesn't know how to get through the scene. And that's, my God, you know, that's the kind of thing that I would expect to find in a really, really good writer's advice book for commercial fiction. Yeah. Uh, she is also thinking about her work in that very practical way. And that's one of the reasons that she's still you know, the master. I love to read about process and talk about process and, you know, learn different philosophies. And I can't say that I've done a lot of, you know, looking her way. Yeah, she's great. I mean, I came across this one particular essay on the, uh, some website, that, uh, some correspondence website, but I think it's coming out of her collected fiction. I talked with a friend of mine, Betty Wolf in grad school. Yeah, she's great in exactly this way. It's all, there, there's, you know, pondering, and but a lot of it is just super practical and very hard-nosed writing advice, which is awesome. So I need to pick up those letters and look at them. Well, don't you love when you're, you know, you're reading something um, and you just, your mind just goes click? And you're like, oh, and you can just see how you can implement that or tweak it and turn it into something else. And, you know, it's like it's finding those doors that, you know, aren't visible to the eye. Yes, yes. And it's rarely as simple as just a, you know, neat, cheap fix. But often you it's just like one sentence that can end up being a touch point for 10 years of work. Uh, my favorite in this example is um, there's a letter from John Keats to his brother George that's pretty famous in Shakespeare criticism. What is it? He's talking about walking home and pondering something after a conversation about poetry with his friends. And he says, at once several things dovetailed in my mind. And um, of that quality which goes to, uh, which determines any success in the art of poetry and which Shakespeare possessed so immensely, I mean, negative capability, that capacity for being in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. You don't need any more writing advice than that. <laughs> else is just uh, illumination yeah no that's great at different stages of the career i don't know maybe you found this too you know at different stages of your writing you start to get tempted and it's something that i've been wrestling with recently you get tempted to kind of ossify and formalize you figure out how it works how i'm going to do it right this is the way mm -hmm. and you can use that stability to do great things or to do um very good things very quickly. But if you want to continue growing, you can't let yourself be so limited. You need to be flexible and supple. You need to let yourself doubt your process and kind of step off of the outline or allow the story or the characters to tell you that, no, we're not actually going to do this thing next, or we need a beat here to rest, or you thought we were going to have sex six chapters from now, but oh, wait. It's, it's happening, so you best be ready. You, you, you can listen on the on the smaller side, and then you can also make it uh, build from it to to the, the structure of a whole book. No, well, I've actually I've been doing a lot of thinking about that as well, and it's coming off of a stint where I was just I want to say I was too focused on my goals, and I for some reason decided to just outline this project to death, and hmm. I sat down and none of these characters wanted to do these things. <laughs> They're it's difficult, right? Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's a balance, though, because, you know, it's a push and pull situation, whereas, you know, you have to listen and trust, but you also, you know, need to pay attention and, you know, not guide, but know when, you know, you're just doing this thing because, you know, okay, all those explosions are just fun. No one needs them. Yeah, sometimes something does need to blow up, but... No, you, you need to be able to separate those from the ones that you're putting in just because, you know, shrug of the shoulders. Well, something needs to die here. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's really tricky. Um, if you're writing a screenplay, then you are putting, to, you're trying fundamentally to put together something logical and then you're trusting the actors and the director to make it work or to find that sort of human element there. Um, and so there are a lot of options. There are a lot of steps where somebody can push back and say, oh, well, you know, this line doesn't really fit here. Or um, maybe we need to take a different angle on the scene. But when you're writing a book and you have this very detailed outline, you don't actually know who these people are yet. You might think you do. And maybe if you've done an enormous amount of sort of groundbreaking and an 
enormous amount of character work and outlining and research. And I don't know, I, the research that works when you're writing something up from whole cloth as much as the, is research as much as the research of rooting around in a library to find details of some character's backstory. But anyway, yeah, you, you have, um, you're, you're sort of doing it all. You're creating, meeting people. And then who are they? What, what do they get up to? And, you know, I don't want to knock outlines too much. I mean, part of my journey in the last few years has been learning how to outline at all and then getting very good at it and realizing how much I could accomplish if I outlined very in a very detailed manner. Um, writing really solid books structurally very quickly um, without a great deal of the sort of old crippling self-doubt but then you know there's this temptation to hit your beats as opposed to letting the characters guide you um, yeah and you you always need to be willing to kind of step off path no well, that's how it works for me anyway well no i didn't i found a i need to have an idea of where i'm going but i just need to there needs to be a fair amount that i can just find but i do yeah. need like a, a loose map like you know i'm i know i'm going to go to the grand canyon and i don't you know, and I know I'm going to stop here, but as far as the other stops and that tree that actually can talk to me, I just met, <laughs> you know, they just, yeah, yeah, they need right. to pop in. Yeah. And I mean, it, thinking about it like a vacation or a trip is not really um, that off the point because there are some trips that really benefit from being very tightly planned. You know, you need to make sure if what you want to do when you're in Copenhagen is eat at a three Michelin star restaurant, you can't just show up and ask for what's open. Um, but you need to be able to figure out sort of as you're starting the project, how much planning do I need? How rigorously slotted out do I need this sort of vacation or this, this story that I'm, I'm going to engage? And there's also a great virtue in the work of just showing up place without all of your details sorted out and without a lot of protection against the environment and then again yeah. we're, we're back to the tricky balance of, of both <laughs> yeah exactly i mean it's a, it, all of it's a tightrope right you can't veer too much to in one direction or the other or your either the work loses a kind of life and that uh, correspondence with what's going on inside you or it becomes totally chaotic mm -hmm. what do you need to sit down to write in you know a, a, a session practically speaking a piece of paper um, <laughs> in general i'll have um i'm often writing on a tablet these days um, for ergonomic reasons it's easier to just loft it up on a book stand or something like that the coffee shop and uh, independent keyboard but fundamentally laptop desktop um i like i do a lot of work on the computer, I, I type a bunch. Um, I like writing longhand, and when I was starting out, I wrote almost everything longhand. But ultimately, it's you can fetishize process a lot. I try not to. Um, if you need some ritual to get you started, then fantastic. And it's I probably need to build a little bit of one to sort of help move me forward because I've been having some um, I don't know, just sort of life scheduling issues recently. But for the most part, if just want to find a quiet space, um, it doesn't have to be perfectly quiet. I like working in coffee shops because I enjoy ignoring people. <laughs> um, and you, you know, some beverage is often helpful. And yeah, just sit and do the work. And so that's, that's really all that's required. It's one of the great things about it as a, as a hobby. You can do it almost anywhere almost any set of materials. Um, some things make it easier or harder. Some stuff you have to type up afterwards. But that's basically it. Yeah, it's definitely, um, I got myself, you know, you can get yourself into trouble with making it too much of a, I need this and, and this. And, and that's another thing that I like about my chaotic life right now is I'm not, I'm just so out of my comfort zone. So yeah, it's like, <laughs> grab something and go. <laughs> yeah, totally. You don't need to walk around the block and listen to your, you know, the, the three songs. You just, you know it. Just sit down, start moving stuff around. Right, yeah. I mean, do you have a, a particularly detailed ritual? I did. It was very detailed where I, I went for a walk. And even now, I mean, I do use music to kind of set my mind and kind of remove myself from my reality. So music is something mm -hmm. that is pretty much 
as there as a pen is. But as far as like what I do beforehand, no, I, you know, I try to think about my work before, you know, I try to think about it before I sit down, but I also try not to think about it too much beforehand because I don't want to be like, you know, fatigued about it. I just kind of, you know, yeah. I need enough. And then, yeah, I'm much less uh, ritualistic about it now. That's great. I mean, yeah, I, I try to just have uh, some time on the schedule that's blocked out where I know I don't have to do anything else. And I'll do my best not to get broil embroiled in any kind of planning for the day before that happens. But, you know, sometimes you have to move things around. And yeah, I'll, when I have a very detailed outline, I'll generally pull it either into the, the specific section of the chapter that I'm working on. I'll either pull it into the, um, the window um, so that I have it for reference. And it's generally when I'm talking detailed, I'm talking like a screenplay outline level detailed. So there will be exchanges between characters in there. Um, there will be some scene setting. Um, and and it, that really can help because if you've worked through the whole story at that level of detail, it's like getting to know the characters mm -hmm. um, a bit. Um, but, yeah, well, the, what you just described, it's kind of like what I call, I, I guess, a zero draft is where, mm, interesting. where, yeah, you have like the bare bones and, you know, the story progressing, but you don't have all the, the prose around it or necessarily, you know, you don't have everything fleshed out, but you, you have the, you have the beats and all that. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it like that, but I guess that it is. Um, I, I really like uh, character and dialogue. I enjoy characters talking to one another and arguing with one another entirely too much. <laughs> so that's, that's sort of fun and easy for me. And that's often my line into a story. Um, it's the, I'm, and this, this is a way that prose actually fits weirdly with me. I, I love writing and I love writing sort of prose fiction, but I'd much rather have characters reveal themselves through dialogue and move and movement than have them sit down and, and sort of have feelings <laughs> in their narration. Yeah. And I'm trying to work a little bit more on that and get some more of that sort of emotional stuff on the page in part because I think that's one of the great gifts of prose fiction. Interiority is one of the things it can do that you can't do in a video game or in a film or television. But still, it's uh, it's tricky. It is. It is tricky. Well, and I have the I I have to tone the back my emotion a lot where it's just like, okay, whoa, we just we don't need those two paragraphs at all. You got your point <laughs> across. Just chill out with that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So if you find yourself like, okay, can you do something now instead of just sitting here and stealing? Mm -hmm. oh, well, I, the you know the first book I ever wrote, which you know nobody you saw except like three people, but mm. um, I have like just three chapters of my you know my protagonists smoking a cigarette and having all this internal thought, and absolutely nothing happens. But she. <laughs> But it was like, I can still look back as far as like, you know, from a writer's right. perspective, it was so fun to do. You know, I just have this character that I, and I know her, you know, I knew, got to know her a lot better, I think, from that. But um, so is, like my weirdness in all of this is I'm not really, um, I don't have an internal monologue like at all. Interesting. Very, yeah, I just very rarely have what I would consider a continued stream of words running through my head. Um, it, it feels a lot more like clouds, sort of a bunch of clouds that are kind of passing over and through one another in a very layered fashion. So it's sort of shimmery constantly. And the words come out of that. But when I'm having, when a character is really just sort of sitting by herself and, and thinking for me, that feels like open space. It's very difficult to render. I, either to try to render in sort of linear prose that sort of overlapping clouds feeling or to render um, the space that they're occupying. You know, I'm that, that guy who when somebody walks up and asks him, you know, what are you thinking about? I, I will generally and perfectly truthfully answer nothing. So it's I find that it, fascinating. It's interesting trying to interpret it. That is interesting. I'm officially fascinated. 
I have way too much of an internal dialogue. It's ridiculous. I feel like I actually have like I have multiple narrator internal dialogue. Like I have it's like, you know, multiple perspective story going on with just like way too much like opinion and feeling. <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, like cloud the sounds inside nice. out situation where you know your your CO is arguing with your sensors officer and all that kind of thing. Oh, definitely, yeah, totally. definitely. But I have, yeah, I have this like total like chill, free like person who's just like let's just let it flow. And then I have somebody else that's like, this is all terrible. You're terrible. Walk <laughs> away. Yes. No, that's funny. You're not terrible. Cloud. Yeah, no, it's- <laughs> I wonder if that might not be a sort of different angles on, on the same thing. Cause like if I, if you asked me to sit down and say, like I could write a dialogue or a, you know, five voice fugue based off of what's going on in my head at any given moment at the drop of a pen. But like, what specifically are you thinking? Uh, yeah. uh, it's, you, know, you want to re- reduce all of that? I, I can t- tell you something, which is generally what people are asking. So, you know, you, there's no need to get too artsy about it. But <laughs> I, I always really empathized with, um, there's a great scene in the uh, seminal Nick Cage classic City of Angels, if you remember that. Oh, from yeah. The I yeah, do. Okay, so. <laughs> Google Dolls. I only ever saw this movie once. But, <laughs> so, for those of you out there in Radio Land who haven't seen it, Nicolas Cage is an angel in this film, uh, and he his job is to serve as a psychopomp. He takes dead people or dying people and then moves them along to the next life. And his angels have a number of powers in this. It's not like a sort of John Constantine hellblazer kind of situation, <laughs> but they they can like move around without being seen or interfered with unless they want to be, and they can hear people's thoughts. And they don't worry about falling. Like there are a bunch of cool scenes of Nicolas Cage like sitting on a road sign over the 405. So there's a moment where he's uh, had, he's developed a sort of, in retrospect, slightly creepy crush on Meg Ryan's character, who's a doctor, and he's wandering around in a hospital trying to you know find her so that they can talk a little bit more. And she's in surgery, and he's walking past all of these people in the hospital having, as one often is in the hospital, the worst day of their lives or some, something on that spectrum. And people are thinking like, oh, my God, how am I going to afford this? Or, you know, oh, no, I just, you know, I just saw her two days ago. What's happening? And like you know, these, these layers of thoughts. And it's, it's really sort of dismal and, and strange. And you can tell how weird it is to be one of these angels to always have access to whatever sort of people are suffering through at any given moment. And he finds Meg Ryan in surgery. She's a surgeon. Around her, there are various nurses and attendants who are all having their own mental fugues, the patients under. And Meg Ryan's thought process in this moment is, I am stuck on Band-Aid brand because Band-Aid's stuck on me. (laughs) Right? She's just like totally blanked out doing the work with some stupid jingle stuck in the back of her head, which I, I don't know. I always really empathized with that moment. That's funny. Yeah. I haven't thought about that movie in so long, but seriously, like I, first of all, I can't even tell you how many times I watched it, you know, when it was kind of new, not like new, new, but it was like, you know, one of those things that was on TBS all the time. Oh, sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah. It's also one of the classics of um, that sort of serial killer who drives the logging truck around the Pacific Northwest, right? (laughs) Like every third, there's a while, like every third movie or television show, there'd be a moment where somebody was, people were having a conversation. Um, they pulled through a four way intersection, just got T boned by a logging truck. And I, I think it's the same one from City of Angels all the time. Like maybe they only had the one truck, or maybe this one guy is just, just like hopping fictional realities to kill people. Oh, hopping fiction realities to kill people. Now there's a story. Yeah, yeah, I think they do that in uh, in Planetary and Warren uh, Ellis's Planetary. There's they totally, yeah. There's a fictional fiction hopping supervillain kind of person who shows up literally for one issue. It's, uh, <laughs> I love that series for all its weirdness, but one of the most frustrating parts is there's this character who shows up literally like powerful sort of uh, intimations of apocalypse kind of individual, and then is never seen or heard from again. Maybe he runs away into another Warren Ellis strip. I don't know. It's funny that the logging trucks, um, when we when I moved to Seattle from um, New Jersey, we drove 
and they're they're around and then some of those you know windy mountain roads it is actually quite terrifying to be near them and i, I remember <laughs> thinking about um the city of angels you could just play it. it's like oh man now i'm going to be like hovering above the car having some sort <laughs> of like not that plot i don't want to go there no no absolutely not <laughs> stay away well i'm glad that you survived the you know, grimdark logging truck apocalypse me too. And uh, hopefully I don't run into any on the way to Arizona. Fair enough. We're driving as well. I have I have a strict, you know, philosophy that if you're going to live somewhere, we need to drive into it and not just land there by plane. That seems reasonable, yeah. I mean, really, what happened is we just, at the time, you know, we needed to drive because all our stuff was just easier. But the kind of going through the state to land somewhere you get to just see i would have never i never knew that there was desert in western washington mm -hmm. i just didn't yeah, know I mean, that yeah the, the continuity of country is really important it's how it's strange how distance collapses like that it's one of the reasons i love I used to love cross-country driving i don't drive a ton anymore um just for various reasons uh, but I also love cross-country trains for that reason. You just get a sense that it, all the country is really here. It's there are jokes that people make about flyover country. I mean, I grew up there myself, but it's it's a whole different sort of experience to see all of those houses that you're passing, not as tiny little um, sort of Lego blocks from 10,000 feet, but that's a house. Somebody's living there. Somebody's sitting on the porch right now. Um, that's a boat. There are people fishing in the boat. And this is the country yeah. that we're just chugging through. No, it's so true. Well, and it's just so, you know, with the daily routine of life, it's so easy to just feel like this is wherever you are is the whole world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. and then you go on your, you know, your, your gadget and you have your feed, but it's just who you've let in your feed. So it's, it's sometimes it's good to just climb out and explore, end up in the desert, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, there's the world you expect to see, and then there's the world that you actually see if you look. Mm -hmm. Well, Max, can you tell um, listeners where they can find you? Sure, yeah. Um, so you can find me on the web at www.maxcladstone.com. And I'm also on Twitter occasionally at, you know, at Max Gladstone. Um, and yeah, I think I have a Facebook page, but don't, don't try to find me on Facebook. <laughs> I don't go there very often. Sounds like a good choice. Yeah, I also, I, I go to conventions and stuff. I'll be at Gen Con this year, if anyone happens to be at Gen Con, um, and probably at World Fantasy also, trying to solidify those plans. And uh, I'll have my sort of con schedule up on my website pretty soon. Oh, awesome. Well, Max, thank you so much for taking the time. It was a lot of fun talking. Yeah, it was great talking with you, too. Thanks so much. And that wraps it up for this week. Be sure to Continue the conversation on Twitter at me, Battingfield, and Too Many Words Pod. And remember to join that Discord channel and unlock other fun exclusives and support the show on patreon.com slash too many wor words. Go to the site for more about me, the show, and my words at tmwpod.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. And before you click away, let others know what you think with a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Sing it from the rooftops. Good luck with your projects. Until next time, over and out. <laughs> <laughs>